I was given a sewing machine when I was 10 years old. It was my 10th birthday. Uh, and that's pretty much it. That's I had a little spot in the garage. I had a bunch of my mom's old clothes and just old random things. And we lived in the middle of nowhere. So I would just like sew things, put them back together. And then um, Brandon, when I was still, I was still in high school and Brandon went to film school. And he was going to school to become a cinematographer. And then he had projects that they needed costuming for. And so I sort of just started designing that way. Um, and I'd always kind of been interested in it, but then I went to school for fashion design. And so I have a fashion design degree and that stuff. Um, but it was sort of fashion and costume at the same time. And then it sort of just grew into bigger things and um, some pretty interesting design opportunities, such as the FP, which is definitely one of my favorite things that I've been able to design. <laughs> It's definitely based in sort of like this weird Mad Max slash video game double dragon slash kind of warriors is what it turned into. Um, and then meets like John Carpenter and then Eight Mile. And then also really it just sort of hinged on what we had because we didn't really have a lot. We didn't have a lot of money to make it at all. We then started talking about things and I was, I don't know, just randomly I had an idea, well, why don't we take the two clans and make it sort of like the Civil War where it's like the 248 or sort of like the good guys and they're from the north and so then we take all the colors and we also incorporated flags so we incorporated the flag of the north and then the flag of the south for the 245 so it was sort of colors and flags insp inspired by the you know American Civil War and had these gangs sort of clash and it really turned into sort of an interesting thing and he even wrote in some you know lines of dialogue based on that too so if you if you look for it you can see it. Don't let this shit put your brain on flips. You gotta think of Beep Beep Revelation like it was a civil war. I said, what? Four score and a couple of years ago, Ma and Pop offered some serious shit. You can't really put your finger on if it's in the past or if it's in the future or just what it is or where it is. You really can't tell what's happening, but there's, you know, like 18 different influences that are affecting this place. We dressed all the teams alike, so whenever you see like the LWE team, He's sort of the keynote leader of the team, but then you can see his other two guys are wearing something that's very similar. Um, and it's the same on the 248 side with JTRO and BTRO, where they have, they have exactly the same outfits, only the colors are inversed. So they're, one's black and blue and one's blue and black. And then also the back of their vests sort of emulates the American flag, sort of the stars and stripes of the flag and the whole everything. And we also used different fonts as well, like the 248 sort of in the digital age, and then the 245 is sort of like this old English gangsta business. Um, and they're sort of a little bit dirtier and grittier, and they have more golds and just weird metallics, and then the 248's very like silver and sleek. We found a lot of things like for Art, who plays KCDC, the majority of his things, even though he's in the 248, so he's sort of like the American flag themed. When LWE comes out and it's the final match, he comes out wearing a gold eye patch and a t-shirt that he rips off of his body. Um, the gold eye patch is a nod to a bunch of Rocky stuff, but then um, the t-shirt that he's wearing is actually this like homemade transfer t-shirt that's a picture of Stacy, and she has a blowtorch and she's writing, fuck you dad, into the carpet and it is written on Sharpie with arrows to her that says I hot dogged this bitch. So if you wanna, if you wanna freeze frame for like two frames, you can, uh, you can see all of those things. Um, but then after he rips that off and he puts on this, you know, his final jumpsuit, it could be probably my favorite costume in the movie. Um, it was just made from scrap materials that I had from other things that I had worked on. Um, I don't think I had to buy a single thing for that costume. Uh, it was completely made from scratch. It's all like, corduroy and stretch gold lame on the sides with real fur cut from this weird old jacket that I had that was falling apart. Um, but it's inspired, it's sort of X-Men meets Mad Max meets uh, the Duke of New York, actually. It's one of the main inspirations for that. The great thing about Lee Valmassey is that when he puts on that jumpsuit, which has probably three layers of shoulder padding, when he, any of those costumes that he puts on, especially that one, he turns into a completely different person, which is kind of my favorite part of my job is putting someone in a costume and watching how it changes them and sort of brings a whole different element to their character. So then when we go into the final match and Jatro receives his, you know, beat beat nigga boots, he also gets Beatro's whole costume. And so, when he shows up finally, he shows up in that black version of Beatrice's vest. But 
Jtro and Btro are there's a considerable height difference between them, and since we didn't really have a lot of money, I had to then add probably three inches to the vest to make it so that it would actually fit Jason Trost. Um, I had to replace the zipper. It was a it was it was a pretty sweet undertaking. But yeah, he actually shows up in Beatrice costume at the end.